Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to our third webinar in the Patriarchy webinar series. Um, this series has, we've been working on it for the majority um, of the summer, and it is something that we are all uh, really excited about and so happy to share with you all. Um, this has been a learning experience for us as well. A lot of the information that we'll be sharing is information that we have really recently learned through research and um, from talking with each other. So that's always exciting. Um, and yeah, I think it would be great if students here can maybe give a short introduction um, just so that everyone can kind of know um, who all is here. And you know, if there are any questions that need to be directed to USL students, you'll know who to to, to point to. Um, I'll go ahead and start. My name is Annie Philp, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am in USL, and I will pass it to Maggie. Great, thank you, Annie. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, her. My name is Maggie Natris, uh, and I am a member of USL, um, and I was also part of uh, a couple other organizations, and glad to see some people here who I recognize, um, and I'll pass it over to Jackson Murphy. Hi, I'm Jackson Murphy. My pronouns are he and his, and I'm a member of USL. Um, and I'll pass it off to Eva. Hi, my name is Eva. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also a member of USL. Um, and I'll pass it off to Abigail. Hi, my name is Abigail Ireland. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a member of USL. And I'll pass it to Derek. Hi folks, my name is Derek Kushiko. I use he, him pronouns. I'm part of USL, um, Solidarity Over Supremacy, and E3 Washington, plus some other groups. And glad to be here. Pass it back to you, Annie. Thank you. Okay, I think as more students are joining, um, please feel free to, uh, if you're a part of USL or a student from South would be, feel free to put your information in the chat. Um, I'm also, I apologize if there's any background noise. Uh, there are a few things going on at my house right now, but please give me a heads up if you cannot hear me. That is kind of a crucial part of the webinar. Um, okay, so getting started here, our third webinar will be focusing on misogyny and toxic masculinity. If you could change the slide, please, Derek. Okay, so going over some housekeeping, we have our Zoom protocol. Um, we do we do appreciate it if your cameras are on. However, we understand if um, that is just not working for you right now. Uh, please make sure that your mic is muted throughout the webinar, um, unless it is you know, a story time and you're sharing, of course. Um, and then make sure to have your name and pronouns in your Zoom name. Uh, or what is presented as your name on the screen here. As you can see in the upper right, uh, we give a little demonstration of how to do that. Um, you can also go and hover over your screen, click on the three dots and then click rename and you should be able to rename that way as well. Okay, if there is a disturbance, um, something happens on the call that we were not expecting um, and is uh, and becomes an issue, um, please turn off your camera and just stay silent for the duration of the disturbance. Um, if it happens to be triggering to folks or a really unsafe situation, we would love if everyone could just leave the meeting. Um, we will contact you via email uh, to reconnect and make sure that everyone is doing okay. Um, this is a precaution that we take that uh, is a result of a few incidents that happened this past year. Um, so this is just something that we do as routine now um, and a good thing to keep in mind. And then lastly, uh, please write down any questions that you have throughout the webinar, and um, we would be happy to hear them during the Q&A section at the end. So please hold those till the end um, and refrain from using the chat when folks are speaking so that all the attention can be drawn to them. Um, that is a pretty important part as well. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pass this off to Maggie for who we are. Great, thank you, Annie. 
Um, so who we are, uh, USL is a student-led and student-organized uh, group here, uh, mostly focused on South Whidbey as far as students. Um, it was founded almost two years ago um, in October of 2019, um, originally uh, focused on connecting with students across Whidbey Island um, and also making certain that youth have a voice in uh, the climate crisis and also in social justice issues. Um, Annie and I originally started uh, focusing on banking on climate. Um, so some of the first actions that were technically USL um, were protests in front of Chase and Wells Fargo Bank uh, for their funding of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and then when we also originally focused as USL on a climate emergency declaration, uh, both for the city of Langley and across uh, Woodby Island, uh, are we are planning eventually to get climate emergency declarations in Elk Harbor and Coopville as well. Um, and one of our major campaigns uh, that most of you have heard about uh, and where we got most of the USL members that are here today uh, is our Transforming Education campaign, uh, which Jackson Murphy is the head of. Uh, and as you can see, uh, that picture there is one of the protests that we held um, around the Transforming Education campaign. Uh, so yeah, brief details of what USL is going for those of you who don't know much about us, but I believe most of you do know us. So glad to see some familiar faces. Um, and I'll pass it over to Annie. Okay. Um, so just going over our webinars here, like I said before, this is our last webinar in the Patriarchy webinar series. Um, our next two webinar series are the Discrimination webinar series and the Climate Crisis webinar series. To give a rough estimate, estimated um, time span for those webinars, I'm guessing that the, the Discrimination webinar series will be towards the beginning of the school year once we get back into the rhythm of um, going to class and doing USL and figuring out our schedules. Uh, and then the Climate Crisis webinar series will probably be just after fall um, as we're getting into the holiday season. So um, just for, for reference for you all. Um, and we're really excited about those two series. Um, for discrimination webinar series, we'll be going further into systems of oppression um, and talking about how uh, the patriarchy upholds those systems of oppression. Um, and then moving forward into the climate crisis webinar series, looking at social justice aspects um, and the injustice within uh, the fight to um, end the climate crisis. And yeah. If we can move to the next slide. Okay, why we're doing this series. So um, we are doing the patriarchy webinar series to spread awareness about the patriarchy and how it affects all of us um, in today's society and the culture in today's society. Uh, we hope that these webinars will help um, community to be more aware of um, how systems of oppression are upheld and ways to dismantle them. Um, in addition, we recognize that uh, when um, a strong system of patriarchy is in place, uh, it discourages folks um, from participating in activism and um, it inhibits a lot of people from um, being at a their full potential to create change. So acknowledging that as well. And next slide, please. Okay, before these webinars, we always like to go into a trigger warning because that is important for the people here. Um, we understand that a lot of the topics that we'll be going over do have, um, are explained in a way that could be triggering to those who have been greatly impacted by um, the patriarchy or misogyny um, or have experienced events in their life that, you know, when we're talking about these subjects um, can be really difficult. So please, uh, if you have to leave the meeting, please feel free to do so. Um, also, you're welcome to turn off your camera uh, or private message us anything that comes up. Um, in addition, we would like this to be a brave space for folks. Um, if this is something that you are still working on and something that uh, you, you know, can recognize that you need to um, be practicing, we hope that this will be a space for you to challenge yourself and um, become more comfortable in being uncomfortable. Uh, that is something that we greatly encourage, and I myself have experienced that in multiple situations, so I understand that it can be difficult. 
but um, it is definitely encouraged. Okay, and just to reiterate, um, we will, you know, if you could keep the private comments or the comments that you have about the webinar um, till the end, that would be great. And I will pass it off to Maggie to start us off. Great, thank you so much, Annie. Uh, so our first topic today is going into misogyny. Um, and if I could have the next slide, that would be great. Uh, so what is misogyny? So this is just a really bare bone uh, definition here. So misogyny is the dislike, contempt for, or engaged, engained, uh, ingrained prejudice against women. So the word is specifically formed with these two Greek roots. Uh, and so it literally means to hate women. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail um, about how it's uh, kind of part of this patriarchy culture that we're talking about in these webinars um, in the next few slides. There we go. So misogyny and racism. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to focus on in these webinars is intersectionality um, and how important those are. Uh, so misogyny as a whole targets women, um, but because of intersectionality and the various issues that um, multiple people face, um, around uh, both their race or how they're perceived by uh, the world in general and our society and its patriarchal views. Um, massage noir is another type of misogyny that is, uh, has been coined by uh, Moya Bailey. Um, and it's specifically uh, specific hatred, dislike or distrust, prejudice directed towards black women. Um, and it's Similar to misogyny, as you can see, the definition is very close, but it's specifically focusing on the fact that if you're uh, Black or if you are perceived as a different race other than white and don't have that privilege, then you have more uh, of a target on your back and you're, you're kind of changed as far as how you uh, are affected by misogyny in your world and in your life. Um, as a white person, I can only speak to this uh, through the research that I did, so I'll put a couple um, of my sources in the chat eventually, um, but it's something that we definitely need to talk about um, in these issues as we bring them up. Black girls and women uh, also share experiences of abuse, trauma, and assault, and then are largely shunned, crit criticized, ignored, um, told that what they're feeling or what they're experiencing isn't the same as what others are feeling or experiencing. Um, despite the fact that it is valid and true. So these are things that we need to continue to uh, take into account as we talk about these things. Next slide. So uh, this was actually originally put together by Maddie um, and talked about uh, originally earlier on in the patriarchy series, um, but misogyny in the LGBTQI plus community is incredibly important to recognize as well. So a person's experiences and roles um, within the patriarchal society that we uh, are a part of are more based on societal perception rather than their own personal identity. So for example, transgender men uh, have misdirected a misogyny uh, towards them uh, as they go through their lives. Transgender women also are uh, impacted by misogyny uh, because of how they are perceived and how they look. Uh, so these are incredibly important to acknowledge because uh, transgender men, of course, are men and have that inherent male privilege, but they also have that layer of misogyny on top. Misdirected, of course, but it's important to acknowledge that. And the patriarchy operates under the assumption that the gender is binary. So we have feminine and masculine uh, qualities um, and the use of she, her pronouns and he, him pronouns as seen as the norm. Uh, so looking into non-binary or different forms of uh, gendered pronouns uh, is incredibly important to start uh, breaking down kind of these norms that we are seeing, um, especially when talking about misogyny, because it's specifically towards women or people who are perceived as women or are more uh, feminine presenting. And then we also have the fetishization, uh, can't speak apparently, uh, of varying sexualities specifically centered around women. So women loving women or uh, lesbians, so on and so forth, uh, by women who are in relationships with other women are targeted more um, or seen as, uh, or sexualized in the media um, because it is to women. And misogyny is um, a large portion of that as is uh, sexism in general. And Annie is gonna go into a little bit of uh, more detail around the difference between misogyny and sexism. 
Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Um, I think that, you know, looking back on my past experience with this topic, um, it's been hard for me to personally differentiate between misogyny and sexism. Um, and, you know, especially since they do go hand in hand. But first, I'd like to start off with sexism. Um, as you can see here, the Cambridge Dictionary defines it as the belief that the members of one sex are less intelligent, able, skillful, etc., than the members of other sex, especially women, um, in regards to being less than men. And then when we look at misogyny, it basically takes it a step further. Um, misogyny enforces sexism when there's a threat of that system going away. It is the general belief or state of understanding not focused on specific actions. If you believe women are only good for serving men and rearing children, then that makes you misogynistic. To clarify, a person can be um, sexist without being misogynistic, but if you are misogynistic, then you are as well, like you're sexist. Um, and so it's interesting to see how those two things go hand in hand, but also um, are differentiable. And it is important to be able to differentiate them um, in regards to the patriarchy and how it affects women in society as well as men in society. Um, just to reiterate, misogyny is a state of being. It is much more perpetual than sexism. Misogyny implies that th implies the fact that you dislike women. However, sexism is more action-based. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we are going to have time here for a one-minute reflection. Uh, you can just simply reflect on how misogyny has impacted your life. Uh, if you cannot think of specific examples, maybe think about how it has impacted the society that you live in or um, the people around you. After we have our one minute reflection, we will be going into um, a 10 minute story time for folks to share out. Uh, and just to reiterate, uh, misogyny does negatively affect, affect men and women. Although it is um, a common misconception that uh, the patriarchy benefits men, that is simply not the case. And I will go into that after this story time here and the reflection. And I'll go ahead and set a timer. Um, please feel free if you have any thoughts that you'd like to write down. Uh, we welcome that. However, we will not um, be you know, sharing those exact reflections. It will be more of a story time later on. Okay, I think it's been just over a minute here. Um, so we could come back to the present space. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch the slides here to our story time. Um, so in the story time, we'll be sharing out, it can either be from your reflection, um, a story from your life, obviously, or uh, how misogyny has impacted your life. And it can just be a broader term as well. Uh, we would like to recognize that, you know, many people in this space may have multiple stories. 
Um, and that is very understandable. Um, and if you would like to give a list of things, um, that is perfectly fine as well. We don't want to limit um, the sharing time. However, we would like to hopefully be moving on in around 15 minutes at the latest. So thank you all for sharing. Uh, I do have another term here, structural sexism. Um, the definition for this is the degree of systematic gender inequality in power and in resources to which someone is exposed. So um, yeah, this is uh, kind of like if you were in um, an office space environment, for example, and uh, the way that you were treated as a woman um, gets to the toxicity that you are unable to work there anymore. You don't feel comfortable presenting. You don't have a space to share your ideas. Um, that's just kind of an example of how um, the, uh, the business that you're working for or the corporation has um, structurally set that up for you as an individual. Um, in addition, uh, women living in states with structural sexism have nearly twice as many chronic conditions, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, um, in comparison to women living in low sexism states. Um, and by states, I mean physical states, such as like Oklahoma and Utah were one of the two examples, um, were two of the five examples, I think. Um, but it could also be uh, in an office space, um, like I said before, in communities, uh, in districts, um, there's just a lot of different ways that this can be expressed depending on who is in the region and also the level of education in the region as well. Um, so uh, this difference is equivalent um, to the health effects of being seven years older. Um, so women who are in high stress um, situations, uh, which is mainly, you know, the result of being in a space with high structural sexism, um, have aged by seven years in comparison to women um, who don't have to be in those environments. Um, I would also like to share the effects that men experience due to um, structural sexism as well. Um, for one, research on other types of structural inequality and health, including structural racism and wealth inequality, has shown that inequality can harm everyone in society. Um, inequality can damage social, social relationships, increase competition for dominance, undermine the social fabric, and make the entire society less safe, less productive, and less healthy. Uh, secondly, studies of masculinities and men's health suggest patriarchal social systems can foster a toxic culture that harms men as well as women. Pressure them to be tough or macho can lead men to engage in risk-taking and unhealthy behaviors like substance use and violence and to avoid going to the doctor, which um, I you know, learned a lot from reading that article. There are a few things that I was not expecting. Uh, but I think this topic ties in perfectly with what Jackson will be going over. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jacqueline Murphy, as I said. Uh, thank you, Annie and Maggie and everyone who shared. Um, that's really great. Um, so first things first, I would like to just acknowledge uh, my privilege here um, as I am a man. Uh, presenting on this, on toxic masculinity. So I bring biases to this, and I'm trying to be very unbiased and present this information. Um, but if any of you see any problems or biases emerge from me, I'd like to hear about them. So thank you. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that this topic is so intertwined with misogyny, just like they were saying. So I'm probably gonna repeat some things that they have already said. Um, so yeah. And I could have my next slide. Okay, so before we get into this, I think it'd be really good just to um, think about in your head, uh, what do you think when you think of masculinity in society? Um, and then I didn't put this on the slide, but I would also ask you to have like a separate like place on your paper and write down like things that you think of as masculinity, like traits or attributes. Um, and I think we should take two minutes on this. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you for doing that. Um, if you'd just like to keep these in mind as we move forward, um, and maybe even like add or adjust your idea. Um, thank you. Okay, I can have my next slide now. Thank you. Okay, so these are just some basic definitions, or not basic, but there's some definitions. Um, so the definition of toxic masculinity that I have are masculine traits which ne negatively affect society and encourage domination, showing no emotion, rejecting anything deemed feminine, the devaluation slash objectification of women and other non-men, homophobia and, and violence slash aggression. Um, that's a lot there. There's a lot to cover. I thought all of those were very important to include in a definition. Um, I'll go over um, them more specifically later. Um, I would like to give some like, examples of how they are in our society though first. Um, I think uh, domination is uh, very important to include in talk to masculinity as it like, it can be subtle, like just dominating a conversation and not leaving space for people who are less, less privileged than you or um, mansplaining, which would be like explaining something simple or obvious uh, just because you can, I guess. Um, so yeah. And this is the definition of masculinity. Um, I did not know that this was the actual definition of masculinity. It makes sense when I think about it. I think it's just very interesting. Uh, qualities or attributes regarded by society as characteristics of men. Um, I just think that's like, it's what we as a society attribute to men. I think that's, I just, so just take a second to think about that because I just think it's really important. And I forgot something, so I'm gonna go back. So um, again, under talks masculinity, something interesting about this is some leaders among the feminist movement um, call talk to masculinity, masculinity under um, patriarchy um, because it calls out the system that created um, that created toxic masculinity and perpetuates it. Um, and this kind of brings up the question, like if masculinity is qualities or attributes regarded by society as characteristics of men and our society is patriarchal, um, just kind of the difference between toxic masculinity and masculinity. Okay. And could I have my next slide, please? Okay. So this kind of led me to a question, is masculinity a social construct? Um, and I would say yes. Masculinity and femininity are for the most part social constructs as their definitions are at traits or attributes that we, that we as a society um, characterize as masculine or feminine. Um, and uh, these attri attributes kind of enforce gender roles as outlined by patriarchy. Um, and even if each of us don't see these things as masculine or feminine and traits as masculine or feminine, or have different ideas of what masculinity and femininity is, our society uh, has pretty set um, kind of traits and attributes for masculinity and femininity. Um, and could I get my next slide, please. Okay, so this leads me to my next thing. Uh, so we're just going to take a little bit. I think we just want everyone to brainstorm what you think um, is masculinity. Um, what do you associate with mass traits associated with masculinity, and then traits you associate with femininity, um, and then we can fill this in. Um, so yeah. I take like 30 seconds to think about it. And Jackson, would you like uh, people to put things in the chat or speak out loud or anything like that? I think um, put it in the chat would be better. Um, and I'm gonna take a drink of water. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you guys would like, um, you can put them in the chat, um, either privately or publicly, um, and we can type them in here, um, but we'll have to exit present mode to um, add to the 
which I believe Derek did and then re-entered present mode. So we can we can figure it out. Okay. Um, I can read out a few that I see in the chat now. Um, and you are welcome, but we have loud, aggressive, uh, confident, all under masculine. Then we also have, I don't know if someone else can uh, jump on the dock and help Jackson out possibly, but uh, under feminine, uh, soft-spoken, listening, caretaker. Um, we also have uh, protective, I can add that in. Also under masculine. Uh, strong under masculine. Competitive. Smart. Um, let's see. Protective came up again. Uh, femininity, we also have uh, caretaker, nurturing, uh, girly, good-mannered, good mask not showing emotions, I would just like to also say, excuse my, my uh, spelling, um, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, Don't judge yeah. me too bad. <laughs> Gotta say for people who like do things in front of large groups of people, Jackson and I both are very bad at spelling when put on the spot. <laughs> you are not alone. Um, let's see. Diligent under feminine, attentive. And not all of them will actually fit on the slideshow, <laughs> but um, thank you all for putting things in the chat for those of you who have. Oh, we also have facial hair or chest hair under more masculine traits that I've seen. Yep, multitasker, not talker, under feminine, elite, under masculine. Great. Jackson, let me know when you want to uh, move on to. I think we can kind of move on now. I think we've gotten a pretty good list. Um, and we can continue to add to this um, if we need to. Uh, we're going to save the chat so I can do that later. Um, thank you, everyone, for doing this. If we can just look at it for like a minute and just like try to analyze it in yourself, like, are any of these, or I guess, are any of these not patriarchal? I mean, I think. Any like non-toxic traits too? It's a really good point, Sylvia. Uh, I think that's something that I have kind of had to think about more when doing this presentation. Um, yeah, for those of you who may or may not be able to access the chat, um, but the whole binary is patriarchal is what Sylvia said. Um, I think they're incredibly correct in that. Um, if you're starting to talk about social norms and toxic masculinity and things like that, how can you 
truly do that if masculinity and femininity are social constructs? How can you start putting people in boxes if the boxes don't exist? So I think that's incredibly important when we start trying to break down um, those inherent kind of gender roles or ideals. Okay, so now that we've thought about that a little bit, um, I think we can go to the next slide. And these are some traits that were assigned to uh, either masculine or feminine. Um, and I think we got like these um, on both sides. Um, I think we got them. So if we can move to the next slide, this is my reflection. Uh, a really, really interesting question that I came to. Um, it's, do you think masculinity can be separate from toxic masculinity under a patriarchal society? Um, and that kind of ties into what Sylvia was saying. They kind of went even farther. Um, so if we could think about this for just one minute, I think that'd be really, really great. Um, I think it's such an interesting question that we have like a long, long conversation about. So just taking a minute to let all of this sink in so far. Okay, I, I don't know if that was a minute, but I think I'm gonna move on. <laughs> okay, um, if we could go to the next slide, um, that'd be great. Okay, so, one sec. There we go. Okay. So this is um, connections to patriarchy. So as I said, this is kind of just like, all interconnected with patriarchy, um, as this is a patriarchy webinar series, and misogyny is connected, and it's all connected. So this is gonna be kind of repeating a lot of what they said around misogyny. But this toxic masculinity is used, uh, is a tool used to perpetuate and uphold a patriarchal society, as I explained earlier. Um, it's just, it's a tool used by patriarchy. So toxic masculinity is a way that men sometimes unknowingly perpetuate the patriarchy in communities, in their communities, homes, and other spaces. Um, just in a way, uh, Annie was talking about in uh, workplaces and in states and stuff like that, how misogyny um, really affects women in those spaces. It also really affects um, toxic masculinity, also um, hurts men in those spaces as well. Um, it can make um, boys and, and other and any men expressing any feminine qualities to be bullied or um other things like that and it just really like puts people into boxes um and enforces the gender roles that uh patriarchy establishes um and it's in, it is ingrained in varying degrees um and is impossible in a patriarchal society not to internalize any patriarchal ideologies including toxic masculinity or misogyny um, and every man and every one has to work to unlearn patriarchal ideologies. Um, it's something that I will be working on uh, forever because it never ends uh, the work. So I think um, that it's just really important that we're having this conversation and that you all are here. And so thank you. Um, and next slide, please. Yes, okay. So connections to heteronormativity. Um, so I'm gonna define heteronormativity. We kind of covered this earlier. I think it was defined in an earlier webinar. The heteronormativity um, is uh, like that being straight is the norm and that a man and a woman together is like the normal way and the only way. Um, and it kind of, it just, it doesn't acknowledge that being gay or being in a gay relationship is not normal. So it kind of, it, it puts, it, it, and it also helps define the uh, gender roles through patriarchy. Um, so yeah. 
And heteronormativity, like toxic masculinity, is a facet of a patriarchal society. Um, as uh, gay people and other people in the LGBTQI plus community fit outside of the gender binary and are therefore a threat to patriarchy. Um, and so all patriarchal societies have heteronormativity um, and they enforce each other. So heteronormativity enforces toxic masculinity and vice versa. So um, like when heteronormativity enforces um, toxic masculinity by uh, making, um, by fitting uh, gay people and other people in uh, gay relationships outside of the gender norm. Um, and it affects, oh my gosh, I'm talking in circles now. I'm gonna take a breath. <laughs> So, okay. Toxic masculinity um, makes men reject femininity um, and heteronormativity tells men that uh, in a relationship, both gender norms must be filled and that gender norms are like how a relationship is. So this perpetuates homophobia as they are outside the gender norms in a patriarchal society um, and it doesn't, and since gay people don't fit into the gender roles, patriarchy outlines, it has homophobia. I kind of got that out there. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, so yeah. And I'm gonna go, you can go to the next slide now. Okay. So there are a lot of words up there. You do not need to read them. I will. Um, so this is something that USL has ran into several times and it's just something we wanted to address when we addressed patriarchy um, and especially talk to masculinity um, and this is men in social class climate justice environments um, and everyone in society as previously mentioned internalizes patriarchal ideologies especially men um, and they bring these ideolo ideologies when they work on social justice and climate justice issues um, climate justice in particular because social justice forces you more to examine your biases that you work on either racism or, or uh, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, misogyny, et cetera. Um, so it kind of forces you to, to examine those bias, biases, but in climate, you can kind of like exclude that and just like we're saving the planet. We don't have to worry about this. So I think it's like very important to understand the interconnection of all of it. Um, something USL has done in our climate declaration and other things like that, and it's just really important. Um, and this needs to change when we, uh, when we need to understand the an intersectionality of all issues. Um, man manifestations of white supremacy and patriarchy culture are why the, the climate uh, movement continues to fail, which is something we want to address in the climate crisis um, webinar series. Um, and to address this, USL is very intentional in deciding to do the three webinar series and the first on HRE and discrimination and then climate change, the climate crisis. So I think that that was a lot. So let's take a little bit to absorb that. But first, actually, uh, Maggie, Annie, Eva, Abigail, USL students, anyone want to share first about anything I forgot? Um, I'll first of all, big thank you, Jackson, for putting this all together and also for acknowledging your own privilege of speaking out on these topics. Um, I think one major thing that we also need to talk about is that in social justice um, spaces, at least like, for example, in USL, um, as of right now, uh, Jackson is the only male member that we have. Um, and that is inherently something that we need to talk about and discuss because um, we, we do need to include or at least give an option for uh, people who are uh, male to learn and grow and kind of confront the things that Jackson's talking about um, and be able to step up into social justice circles while also not uh, bringing in these toxic traits. Um, so I think it's incredibly important to recognize that and learn um, with uh, others as we're talking about these very, very uh, detailed and kind of huge topics that we're trying to cover in like an hour and a half. So <laughs> thank you all uh, for listening. And yeah, I don't know, any other USL members want to add anything? 
Um, I guess I just add uh, that, you know, this is a lot of information to take in. I think Jackson, like you said, you know, each one of your slides could be like a whole, you know, two hour conversation. Um, and this is, these are things that we, like people study in college. These are things that, you know, you can't fully grasp um, in, you know, just, just a few weeks time. So uh, I think that, you know, looking back on the work that we've done, it's been really great to see what has been put together. Um, and I'm also really excited to see how we can take this information and apply it to future projects and future campaigns um, and to continue, you know, sharing this information, improving it, uh, making it more accessible. Um, yeah, so just looking forward to that. Abigail, Eva, Maddie. One. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, next, uh, we have to, I'm going to pass it off to Derek for some stories about allyship and accountability. Um, and I took um, way more time than I was given. So sorry about that. <laughs> No worries. Thank you, Jackson. And thank you, Annie and Maggie, for your presentations earlier. Um, so I'm going to speak quickly and um, trim some of the things. Uh, but I did want to uh, kick off with um, one story in particular. Uh, and I'll drop the screen share here. One second. All right, folks. Um, so I was part of an organization. I was on its board of directors. I was the program uh, volunteer program manager for one of its programs. Um, and um, this organization gave, uh, had like kind of an annual overnight action camp that had like five days of like an overnight stay. And um, <clears throat> one of the uh, board members of the organization um, was sexually harassing one of the young women participants. Um, and that when that came to light, uh, when that issue was raised with the executive director, he um, made the mistake of taking this man out on a lake on a rowboat and talking with him about it. Uh, but what he did wrong was disclose the name of the women that had um, basically outed him. And so then he, and he wasn't removed from the camp, he was allowed to stay. So now armed with the information of who his um, accusers were, he actually went after them that night. Uh, and it just became this really huge issue. Uh, the next day, um, a women's circle was convened, uh, but rather than um, pausing this retreat to deal with the situation that happened, uh, the director insisted on continuing the program uh, and insisting that people that, who were presenting sessions continue to present their sessions while this women's circle was happening. Uh, ultimately, uh, the board of directors of which I was a member, um, we didn't hear about it for 45 days. And it, would, it took a woman who was in that circle to bring it up to the board. And when an attempt was made to hold the executive director accountable and to hold the organization accountable, the only thing that, that was actually won was getting the uh, person off the board, um, but the um, kind of resulting investigation led to an 80 page document full of seven years worth of sexism and patriarchy that this executive director um, was uh, causing. And we identified dozens of stories uh, and shared this information with the new board, uh, but there was pushback, the existing board, us three members who were trying to hold accountability were thrown off. Um, a program that supported people of color uh, in their activism was canceled and they were uh, left uh, to not have financial support to do their activism. Meanwhile, um, white male organizers were allowed to continue organizing and they were grandfathered into uh, continuing to have financial support from the organization and fiscal sponsorship. Um, you know, just a couple other, and I could 
get way into the details of this. It was an extremely painful, uh, long experience um, dealing with that. And a couple of just few other stories. Um, the uh, There's a port commissioner at the Port of Seattle uh, who was toxic and took up a lot of space in meetings. He was a know-it-all and really um, shut down participation from other organizations and shut down um, participation from non-males. Uh, he also wandered around the office at the Port of Seattle grabbing women and um, being just all around toxic uh, presence. Uh, there's a senator in the, um, uh, Senator Kevin Ranker in the 40th Legislative District, uh, similar, had these behaviors that um, were, he was like a champion of environmentalism. I mean, he was absolutely on top of orca and salmon relief and restoring the Puget Sound. He was all about, um, you know, dealing with fossil fuels and how we stop climate change. And he was like the environmental champion, but the way he carried himself in the legislature led to a large number of legislators refusing to uh, vote for anything that he put on the table because of the way he behaved. And ultimately he was forced to resign because of uh, some things in his private life. Um, on the other hand, um, a good story that uh, of someone that I was working with um, exhibited some toxic masculinity and uh, led to a lot of pain in this um, climate uh, group that I was involved in. And uh, it led to the um, woman of color on the group leaving um, the group and not being able to participate. And it caused a lot of tension throughout the entire project. Uh, but ultimately, at, through the end of it, uh, we engaged a consultant in a transformational justice process that helped to illuminate some of the issues, helped to give folks uh, with those historically marginalized identities an opportunity to share what their experience was. And um, he ultimately uh, declared his intention to um, make things right with the organization and uh, attend um, trainings and to, um, to be accountable. So that's kind of a good example of, hey, the, the, he was initially um, triggered and unwilling to participate and later uh, stepped up to accountability and stepped up to uh, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, some things in terms of allyship I wanna share. Uh, you know, I think it's really key in any climate and social justice space for there to be allies. And uh, those of us who want to be allies, uh, we are not the ones that decide whether we're allies. Um, I, the, the, the people who we are attempting to be allies to get to decide if we are allies. We don't declare ourselves to be allies. And similar around accountability, we don't, if, if we are being held accountable, it's not up to us to define <clears throat> what accountability looks like. It's up to those who are the survivors, those who have been marginalized or oppressed to define what accountability looks like. And um, just a few, a handful of additional concepts that around allyship that I wanna put forward. Um, one of them is to believe survivors. Uh, if someone has been impacted or harmed you know, in, in, in patriarchy, there's this temptation to not believe them and they have to prove that they were harmed. And instead we should lead with believing them. And then we can think critically if needed, but let's believe them. And unless we have a strong reason not to, let's lead with the believing. Uh, another one is to recognize identity, recognize our own identity and, and how we are perceived and what and how that perception uh, and how our identity um, is affecting other people in the space. So for example, right now, I am a cisgender male, uh, but I am a person of color, uh, but recognizing the topic is patriarchy as a cisgender male, I have, uh, I have that positionality relative to the rest of the participants on this webinar. Another concept I think is important is to protect the identities of survivors. As I mentioned, it was extremely dangerous and harmful for the young woman who uh, outed the, the perpetrator for the executive director to reveal her name and then have him then go after her. So uh, not revealing identities of survivors uh, without consent. And that applies not only to uh, overt 
forms of harassment or assault, but that applies in any space when we're uh, privileged to hold information or relationships with people. Uh, and then naming perpetrators often, in fact, I did it just now, I didn't name the organization and I didn't name the name of the perpetrator. That doesn't solve anything, that doesn't help us as a movement and as a community to know who it is that we should be aware of and to be worried about. So I'll name them right now. The organization was Backbone Campaign. They're an artful activism and climate justice group based right here in the Northwest. The executive director, Bill Moyer, uh, was called out for seven years of patriarchy and sexism. Has he changed? Maybe. I don't know that. Fred Fellerman was the port commissioner who was uh, complicit in, in his behavior and Kevin Ranker, I did actually mention. Um, I also have a whole story about Cliff Mass, but uh, in the interest of time, I won't uh, bring that up, but that has impacted us in, in our community around Sound Waters University who had Cliff Mass as a speaker. And there's a lot of layers within that that I can share at another time or offline. Uh, and the last concept I wanna bring up is uh, consent culture. And we talked about this uh, last time a little bit, um, but just, inviting us to practice consent when working with people and especially uh, around touch, uh, you know, asking people if they want a hug or before you touch their shoulders or anything that just asking for consent before touching anyone uh, is really key. But that consent culture applies beyond that. It's, it's how we can show up in spaces. We can ask for consent and uh, whether we uh, talk about something, uh, whether we are going to agree to take on a project, uh, we can uh, ask consent on any of it. But um, in regard to the um, topic at hand around how we uh, dismantle misogyny and toxic masculinity, asking questions, um, ask, ask questions and, and learn together. Um, but before asking someone uh, to whom you would be accountable, ask them for consent before asking questions because maybe people don't want to process with you. Uh, and and um, so asking first before uh, processing at somebody. So I'm um, just offering some of these concepts. Thank you for um, uh, allowing me to present at the webinar, Maggie, Nanny, and Jackson, and I'll hand it back. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Derek. Um, I think that it is, really helpful, you know, for folks who are maybe unable to identify certain instances in their own life to be able to have those examples that you presented. Um, and I really appreciate the points of allyship that you presented at the end as well. Um, and also touching on consent, because uh, I think that, you know, looking at um, consent historically, uh, we have just tied it um, to certain topics and it needs to be um, applied to, to the general terms as well. Okay, we are now moving on to the closing. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here today um, and for committing another hour and a half to uh, your self-education, bettering the community and talking with us um, and having these conversations because they are really crucial. Uh, we have a few calls to action for you. Um, please promote the webinar series to families, to family and friends. Um, they are recorded and we will go ahead and send out um, the third recording, the recording of this webinar um, in the following weekly email or in a separate e email depending. Um, please share what you've learned with family and friends around you. Um, hold each other accountable. And if you can donate, um, I'm seeing a few people here who have already donated to um, USL in the recent weeks after we put out our fundraiser. So thank you so much for donating. We really appreciate that. And all the funds will be used towards projects coming up next year that we are very excited about. Um, if you are interested in donating, I'm wondering, Derek, if you could paste that link in the chat. Um, it was also, if you have trouble finding the link in the chat, um, there was something sent out in a recent email with a link to the fundraiser. Okay, I tried to go through that pretty quickly so that we have a, a few more minutes for the Q&A. Um, but Derek, if, there we go. So we're now at our Q&A discussion. 
Um, we only have eight minutes left in uh, in today's webinar, but if there are things that need to be gone over um, afterwards, that is fine as well. Um, if folks are needing to hop off now or at 5.30, please feel free to do so. Um, and we really appreciate your time here. I'm now going to open it up to questions. Um, and when we do go through questions, please raise your hand and I will go ahead and make a stack in the chat. Uh, and then um, for students who are wanting to answer those questions, uh, go ahead and just raise your hand as well and I'll, I'll make sure to call on you. So, yeah. Okay, I think we have Nick and then Peter. I'll put you two in the chat. Thank you. I just wanted to make uh, two comments. One of them, I think, to help illustrate toxic masculinity is when you take a list of traits in the way that our society, if those traits are exhibited by a man, they're one thing, like confidence, loud, um, assertive. And if those same traits are exhibited by a woman, they're often seen as something else. And um, that was just one thought I had in my head as a way to illustrate them. And the other part, I think when it comes to um, how that toxic masculinity ties into the climate crisis is we, we socially value this idea of competitiveness and making money and making more and when more becomes destructive to the or organism, whether it's the earth or you know some smaller level of that, toxic masculinity doesn't care. It just says, I gotta, I gotta keep up, I gotta consume, I gotta make more. Why, right? When, it, when you've killed all the ducks and there can be no more ducks, you're in such a short-sighted view. I, think I would say that that's where that concept connects to the climate crisis. Is there's way too much emphasis now on that on the toxic traits um, applied to like businesses. So those are my two thoughts. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. that. Um, yeah, yeah, that was great. I completely agree. Um, and I really like the reference to the climate crisis because I think that that is very prevalent right now. You know, when we look at our economy and, you know, our exponential growth, uh, that's definitely something that comes to mind. Any students who would like to add? Okay, great. Um, Peter, you're next on the stack. Okay, I have to run to another meeting, city council stuff. Um, I, I found this to be uh, uh, an interesting webinar. I do want to make a comment that there are there's room in some areas for counterpoint and uh, unfortunately, there's no time for it or no structure within the webinar in order to have that kind of a discussion. Yeah, all of these topics that we're bringing up are definitely uh, conversations that can be continued to uh, take place. And it's definitely important to take uh, some of the things that we say with a grain of salt because we are youth um, and we are still learning. Um, but it's also important to recognize um, being uncomfortable and seeing new uh, ideas and taking them inside um, and definitely asking questions. So thank you for that. Jackson, go ahead. Um, I do not think this is the space for that conversation. If you would like to have that conversation with USL or other groups that can happen outside of this, I would also just like to say that I do not believe there are any counterpoints to what we discussed today as we're just acknowledging systems of oppression. Um, so I would just, that's what I would like to say. Okay, well, so long guys, gotta go. Hi, Peter. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? Uh, Maureen? Hi, um, thank you. This was really a food for thought. And um, one of the things that came up was just a contemplation about um, maybe similar to what Nick raised about um, when different gender appearing people display particular um, qualities. So if I identify as a woman or as a, 
uh, she, her, and I am behaving in a dominant or somehow, um, you know, aggressive or strong or, or even abusive manner, um, is that uh, toxic masculinity? It's just an interesting inquiry. Um, that's all. Yeah, that's totally an interesting topic to bring up, um, especially as we're going into kind of how, how can we continue to talk about masculinity and femininity if they are social constructs. But yeah, I, I think that's definitely something to look into, like what can be considered um, toxic masculinity? Can women fall under toxic masculinity? Um, so on and so forth. Um, and I don't know if I can actually answer that question or not, but it's definitely something to think about. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, Sarah, I see you have your hand raised. One thought I'm just having as this conversation is going on is that, you know, uh, the patriarchy is a binary construct. And so we have femininity and masculinity as being binary, and they are not. Everything is connected there's all interconnections. And so it's a really hard topic to condense into smaller segments, but I, uh, I applaud you for your courage in stepping in and actually uh, articulating, talking about exposing people to and encouraging uh, those of us that are on the, the webinar to keep talking about this with other people. And that's the way change happens. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think that, you know, being able to have this space with all of us, um, from the community or folks even outside of Island County as well. Um, it's been really great to discuss these topics. And of course, you know, it's not, it's not a discussion that can just take up an hour and a half. Um, so we'll definitely be furthering this um, in future meetings and in future webinars as well. And, you know, continuing, continuing to learn and grow from this as well. And uh, put what we've learned into, um, into projects. And it is 5.30, so if folks are needing to leave, please feel free to. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, you're welcome to raise your hand right now or send us an email if something comes up. Um, but thank you all again.